This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tracy Hall. Anderson's Fairy Tales by Hans Christian Andersen. The Real Princess. Epimelia Yorgos Pitropoyanakis. There was once a prince who wished to marry a princess, but then she must be a real princess. He traveled all over the world in hopes of finding such a lady, but there was always something wrong. Princesses he found in plenty, but whether they were real princesses, it was impossible for him to decide, for now one thing, now another, seemed to him not quite right about the ladies. At last he returned to his palace quite cast down, because he wished so much to have a real princess for his wife. One evening a fearful tempest arose. It thundered and lightened, and the rain poured down from the sky in torrents. Besides, it was as dark as pitch. All at once there was heard a violent knocking at the door, and the old king, the prince's father, went out himself to open it. It was a princess who was standing outside the door. What with the rain and the wind, she was in a sad condition. The water trickled down from her hair, and her clothes clung to her body. She said she was a real princess. Ah, we shall soon see that, thought the old queen mother. However, she said not a word of what she was going to do, but went quietly into the bedroom, took all the bedclothes off the bed, and put three little peas on the bedstead. She then laid twenty mattresses, one upon another, over the three peas, and put twenty feather beds over the mattresses. Upon this bed the princess was to pass the night. The next morning she was asked how she had slept. Oh, very badly indeed, she replied. I have scarcely closed my eyes the whole night through. I do not know what was in my bed, but I had something hard under me, and am all over black and blue. It has hurt me so much. Now it was plain that the lady must be a real princess, since she had been able to feel the three little peas through twenty mattresses and twenty feather beds. None but a real princess could have had such a delicate sense of feeling. The prince accordingly made her his wife, being now convinced that he had found a real princess. The three peas were, however, put into the cabinet of curiosities, where they are still to be seen, provided they are not lost. Wasn't this a lady of real delicacy? Epimelia Yorgos Pitropoyanakis End of the Real Princess This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. Andersen's Fairy Tales by Hans Christian Andersen. The Emperor's New Clothes. Many years ago there was an emperor who was so excessively fond of new clothes that he spent all his money in dress. He did not trouble himself in the least about his soldiers, nor did he care to go either to the theatre or the chase, except for the opportunities then afforded him for displaying his new clothes. He had a different suit for each hour of the day, and, as of any other king or emperor one is accustomed to say, he is sitting in council, it was always said of him, the emperor is sitting in his wardrobe. Time passed merrily in the large town which was his capital. Strangers arrived every day at the court. One day two rogues, calling themselves weavers, made their appearance. They gave out that they knew how to weave stuffs of the most beautiful colors and elaborate patterns, the clothes manufactured from which 
should have the wonderful property of remaining invisible to every one who was unfit for the office he held, or who was extraordinarily simple in character. These must indeed be splendid clothes, thought the emperor. Had I such a suit, I might at once find out what men in my realms are unfit for their office, and also be able to distinguish the wise from the foolish. This stuff must be woven for me immediately. And he caused large sums of money to be given to both the weavers, in order that they might begin their work directly. So the two pretended weavers set up two looms, and affected to work very busily, though in reality they did nothing at all. They asked for the most delicate silk and the purest gold thread, put both into their own knapsacks, and then continued their pretended work at the empty looms until late at night. I should like to know how the weavers are getting on with my cloth, said the emperor to himself, after some little time had elapsed. He was, however, rather embarrassed when he remembered that a simpleton, or one unfit for his office, would be unable to see the manufacture. To be sure, he thought he had nothing to risk in his own person, but yet he would prefer sending somebody else to bring him intelligence about the weavers and their work before he troubled himself in the affair. All the people throughout the city had heard of the wonderful property the cloth was to possess, and all were anxious to learn how wise or how ignorant their neighbors might prove to be. I will send my faithful old minister to the weavers, said the emperor at last, after some deliberation. He will be best able to see how the cloth looks, for he is a man of sense, and no one can be more suitable for his office than he is. So the faithful old minister went into the hall where the knaves were working with all their might at their empty looms. What can be the meaning of this? thought the old man. Opening his eyes very wide, I cannot discover the least bit of thread on the looms. However, he did not express his thoughts aloud. The impostors requested him very courteously to be so good as to come nearer their looms, and then asked him whether the design pleased him, and whether the colors were not very beautiful, at the same time pointing to the empty frames. The poor old minister looked and looked. He could not discover anything on the looms, for a very good reason, viz., there was nothing there. What? thought he again. Is it possible that I am a simpleton? I have never thought so myself, and no one must know it now if I am so. Can it be that I am unfit for my office? No, that must not be said either. I will never confess that I could not see the stuff. Well, Sir Minister, said one of the knaves, still pretending to work, you do not say whether the stuff pleases you. Oh, it is excellent, replied the old minister, looking at the loom through his spectacles. The pattern and the colors, yes, I will tell the emperor without delay how very beautiful I think them. We shall be much obliged to you, said the impostors. And then they named the different colors and described the pattern of the pretended stuff. The old minister listened attentively to their words, in order that he might repeat them to the emperor, and then the knaves asked for more silk and gold, saying that it was necessary to complete what they had begun. However, they put all that was given them into their knapsacks. And continued to work with as much apparent diligence as before at their empty looms. The emperor now sent another officer of his court to see how the men were getting on, and to ascertain whether the cloth would soon be ready. It was just the same with this gentleman as with the minister. He surveyed the looms on all sides, but could see nothing at all but the empty frames. Does not the stuff appear as beautiful to you as it did to my lord the minister? asked the impostors of the emperor's second ambassador, at the same time making the same gestures as before, and talking of the design and colors which were not there. I certainly am not stupid, thought the messenger. It must be that I am not fit for my good, profitable office. That is very odd. However, 
"'No one shall know anything about it.' "'And accordingly he praised the stuff he could not see, "'and declared that he was delighted with both colours and patterns. "'Indeed, please your imperial majesty,' he, said he to his sovereign when he returned, "'the cloth which the weavers are preparing is extraordinarily magnificent.' The whole city was talking of the splendid cloth which the emperor had ordered to be woven at his own expense. And now the emperor himself wished to see the costly manufacture while it was still in the loom. Accompanied by a select number of officers of the court, among whom were the two honest men who had already admired the cloth, he went to the crafty impostors who, as soon as they were aware of the emperor's approach, went on working more diligently than ever, although they still did not pass a single thread through the looms. "'Is not the work absolutely magnificent?' said the two officers of the crown, already mentioned. "'If your majesty will only be pleased to look at it, what a splendid design, what glorious colours!' And at the same time they pointed to the empty frames, for they imagined that every one else could see this exquisite piece of workmanship. "'How is this?' said the emperor to himself. "'I can see nothing. This is indeed a terrible affair. Am I a simpleton, or am I unfit to be an emperor? That would be the worst thing that could happen. "'Oh, the cloth is charming,' said he aloud. "'It has my complete approbation.' and he smiled most graciously, and looked closely at the empty looms, for on no account would he say that he could not see what two of the officers of his court had praised so much. All his retinue now strained their eyes, hoping to discover something on the looms, but they could see no more than the others. Nevertheless they all exclaimed, "'Oh, how beautiful!' and advised his majesty to have some new clothes made from this splendid material, for the approaching procession. Magnificent, charming, excellent, resounded on all sides, and every one was uncommonly gay. The emperor shared in the general satisfaction, and presented the impostors with the riband of an order of knighthood, to be worn in their buttonholes, and the title of gentlemen weavers. The rogues sat up the whole of the night before the day on which the procession was to take place, and had sixteen lights burning, so that every one might see how anxious they were to finish the emperor's new suit. They pretended to roll the cloth off the looms, cut the air with their scissors, and sewed with needles without any thread in them. "'See!' cried they at last. THE EMPEROR'S NEW CLOTHES ARE READY. And now the Emperor, with all the grandees of his court, came to the weavers, and the rogues raised their arms, as if in the act of holding something up, saying, Here are your Majesty's trousers, here is the scarf, here is the mantle. The whole suit is as light as a cobweb, one might fancy one has nothing at all on when dressed in it. That, however, is the great virtue of this delicate cloth. Yes, indeed, said all the courtiers, although not one of them could see anything of this exquisite manufacture. If your imperial majesty will be graciously pleased to take off your clothes, we will fit on the new suit in front of the looking-glass. The emperor was accordingly undressed, and the rogues pretended to array him in his new suit, the emperor turning round from side to side before the looking-glass. "'How splendid his majesty looks in his new clothes, and how well they fit!' everyone cried out. "'What a design! What colours! These are indeed royal robes!' "'The canopy which is to be borne over your majesty in the procession is waiting,' announced the chief master of the ceremonies. "'I am quite ready,' answered the emperor. "'Do my new clothes fit well?' asked he, turning himself round again before the looking-glass, 
in order that he might appear to be examining his handsome suit. The lords of the bedchamber, who were to carry his majesty's train, felt about on the ground, as if they were lifting up the ends of the mantle, and pretended to be carrying something, for they would by no means betray anything like simplicity, or unfitness for their office. So now the emperor walked under his high canopy in the midst of the procession, through the streets of his capital, and all the people standing by and those at the windows cried out, Oh, how beautiful are our emperor's new clothes! What a magnificent train there is to the mantle, and how gracefully the scarf hangs! In short, no one would allow that he could not see these much admired clothes, because in doing so he would have declared himself either a simpleton or unfit for his office. Certainly none of the emperor's various suits had ever made so great an impression as these invisible ones. But the emperor has nothing on at all, said a little child. Listen to the voice of innocence, exclaimed his father, and what the child had said was whispered from one to another. But he has nothing on at all, at last cried out all the people. The emperor was vexed, for he knew that the people were right, but he thought the procession must go on now. And the lords of the bedchamber took greater pains than ever to appear holding up a train, although, in reality, there was no train to hold. End of the Emperor's New Clothes Read by Kara Schallenberg On March 6, 2006 In Oceanside, California This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tracy Hall Anderson's Fairy Tales by Hans Christian Andersen Epimelia Yorgos Pitropoyanakis The fire burned with such blessed influence. It warmed so delightfully. The little girl had already stretched out her feet to warm them too, but the small flame went out. The stove vanished. She had only the remains of the burned-out match in her hand. She rubbed another against the wall. It burned brightly, and where the light fell on the wall, there the wall became transparent like a veil, so that she could see into the room. On the table was spread a snow-white tablecloth. Upon it was a splendid porcelain service, and the roast goose was steaming famously with a stuffing of apple and dried plums. And what was still more capital to behold was, the goose hopped down from the dish, reeled about on the floor with knife and fork in its breast, till it came up to the poor little girl when the match went out and nothing but the thick, cold, damp wall was left behind. She lighted another match, now there she was sitting under the most magnificent Christmas tree. It was still larger and more decorated than the one which she had seen through the glass door in the rich merchant's house. Thousands of lights were burning on the green branches, and gaily colored pictures such as she had seen in the shop windows looked down upon her. The little maiden stretched out her hands towards them when the match went out. The lights of the Christmas tree rose higher and higher. She saw them now as stars in heaven. One fell down and formed a long trail of fire. Someone is just dead, said the little girl, for her old grandmother, the only person who had loved her, and who was now no more, had told her that when a star falls, a soul ascends to God. She drew another match against the wall. It was again light and in the luster there stood the old grandmother, so bright and radiant, so mild, and with such an expression of love. Grandmother, 
cried the little one. Oh, take me with you. You go away when the match burns out. You vanish like the warm stove, like the delicious roast goose, and like the magnificent Christmas tree. And she rubbed the whole bundle of matches quickly against the wall, for she wanted to be quite sure of keeping her grandmother near her. And the matches gave such a brilliant light that it was brighter than at noonday. Never formerly had the grandmother been so beautiful and so tall. She took the little maiden on her arm, and both flew in brightness and in joy so high, so very high, and then above was neither cold nor hunger nor anxiety. They were with God. Epimelia, Yorgos Pitropoyanakis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. Andersen's Fairy Tales by Hans Christian Andersen. The Swineherd. There was once a poor prince who had a kingdom. His kingdom was very small, but still quite large enough to marry upon, and he wished to marry. It was certainly rather cool of him to say to the emperor's daughter, Will you have me? But so he did, for his name was renowned far and wide, and there were a hundred princesses who would have answered, Yes, and thank you kindly. We shall see what this princess said. Listen. It happened that where the prince's father lay buried, there grew a rose tree, a most beautiful rose tree, which blossomed only once in every five years, and even then bore only one flower. But that was a rose. It smelt so sweet that all cares and sorrows were forgotten by him who inhaled its fragrance. And furthermore, the prince had a nightingale, who could sing in such a manner that it seemed as though all sweet melodies dwelt in her little throat. So the princess was to have the rose and the nightingale, and they were accordingly put into large silver caskets and sent to her. The emperor had them brought into a large hall, where the princess was playing visiting with the ladies of the court, and when she saw the caskets with the presents, She clapped her hands for joy. "'Ah, oh, if it were but a little pussy-cat,' said she. But the rose-tree, with its beautiful rose, came to view. "'Oh, how prettily it is made,' said all the court ladies. "'It is more than pretty,' said the emperor. "'It is charming.' But the princess touched it, and was almost ready to cry. "'Fie, papa,' said she. It is not made at all. It is natural. Let us see what is in the other casket before we get into a bad humor, said the emperor. So the nightingale came forth and sang so delightfully that at first no one could say anything ill-humored of her. Superbe, charmant, exclaimed the ladies, for they all used to chatter French, each one worse than her neighbor. How much the bird reminds me of the musical box that belonged to our blessed empress, said an old knight. Oh, yes, these are the same tones, the same execution. Yes, yes, said the emperor, and he wept like a child at the remembrance. I would still hope that it is not a real bird, said the princess. Yes, it is a real bird said those who had brought it. Well, then let the bird fly, said the princess, and she positively refused to see the prince. However, he was not to be discouraged. He daubed his face over brown and black, pulled his cap over his ears, and knocked at the door. Good day to my lord, the emperor, said he. Can I have employment at the palace? Why, yes, said the emperor. 
I want someone to take care of the pigs, for we have a great many of them. So the prince was appointed imperial swineherd. He had a dirty little room close by the pigsty, and there he sat the whole day and worked. By the evening he had made a pretty little kitchen pot. Little bells were hung all around it, and when the pot was boiling, these bells tinkled in the most charming manner, and played the old melody, Ach, du lieber Augustin, alles ist weg, 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 which translates as, Ah, dear Augustine, all is gone, gone, gone. But what was still more curious, whoever held his finger in the smoke of the kitchen pot immediately smelt all the dishes that were cooking on every hearth in the city. This, you see, was something quite different from the rose. Now the princess happened to walk that way, and when she heard the tune she stood quite still and seemed pleased, for she could play Lieber Augustine. It was the only piece she knew, and she played it with one finger. "'Why, there is my piece,' said the princess. "'That swineherd must certainly have been well educated. "'Go in and ask him the price of the instrument. "'So one of the court ladies must run in. "'However, she drew on wooden slippers first. "'What will you take for the kitchen pot?' said the lady. "'I will have ten kisses from the princess,' said the swineherd. "'Yes, indeed,' said the lady. "'I cannot sell it for less,' rejoined the swineherd. "'He is an impudent fellow,' said the princess, and she walked on. "'But when she had gone a little way, the bells tinkled so prettily, "'Ach, du lieber Augustin, alles ist weg, weg, weg.' "'Stay,' said the princess. "'Ask him if you will have ten kisses from the ladies of the court.' "'No, thank you,' said the swineherd. Ten kisses from the princess, "'or I keep the kitchen pot myself.' "'That must not be either,' said the princess. "'But do you all stand before me, that no one may see us?' "'And the court ladies placed themselves in front of her, and spread out their dresses. The swineherd got ten kisses, and the princess, the kitchen pot. That was delightful. The pot was boiling the whole evening, and the whole of the following day. They knew perfectly well what was cooking at every fire throughout the city, from the chamberlains to the cobblers. The court ladies danced and clapped their hands. We know who has soup, and who has pancakes for dinner today, who has cutlets and who has eggs. How interesting! Yes, but keep my secret, for I am an emperor's daughter. The swineherd, that is to say, the prince, for no one knew that he was other than an ill-favoured swineherd, let not a day pass without working at something. He at last constructed a rattle, which, when it was swung around, played all the waltzes and jig tunes which have ever been heard since the creation of the world. "'Ah, that is superb!' said the princess when she passed by. "'I have never heard prettier compositions. "'Go in and ask him the price of the instrument, "'but mind, he shall have no more kisses. "'He will have a hundred kisses from the princess,' "'said the lady who had been to ask.' "'I think he is not in his right senses,' said the princess, and walked on. "'But when she had gone a little way, she stopped again. "'One must encourage art,' said she. "'I am the emperor's daughter. "'Tell him he shall, as on yesterday, have ten kisses from me, "'and may take the rest from the ladies of the court.' "'Oh, but we should not like that at all,' said they. "'What are you muttering?' "'asked the princess. "'If I can kiss him, surely you can. "'Remember that you owe everything to me.' "'So the ladies were obliged to go to him again. "'A hundred kisses from the princess,' said he, "'or else let everyone keep his own. "'Stand around,' said she, "'and the ladies stood round her "'whilst the kissing was going on. 
"'What can be the reason for such a crowd close by the pigsty?' said the emperor, who happened just then to step out on the balcony. He rubbed his eyes and put on his spectacles. "'They are the ladies of the court. I must go down and see what they are about.' So he pulled up his slippers at the heel, for he had trodden them down. As soon as he had got into the courtyard, he moved very softly, and the ladies were so much engrossed with counting the kisses, that all might go on fairly, that they did not perceive the emperor. He rose on his tiptoes. "'What is all this?' said he, when he saw what was going on, and he boxed the princess's ear with his slipper, just as the swineherd was taking the eighty-sixth kiss. "'March out,' said the emperor, for he was very angry, and both princess and swineherd were thrust out of the city. The princess now stood and wept, the swineherd scolded, and the rain poured down. "'Alas, unhappy creature that I am,' said the princess, "'if I had but married the handsome young prince. Ah, how unfortunate I am!' and the swineherd went behind a tree, washed the black and brown colour from his face, threw off his dirty clothes, and stepped forth in his princely robes. He looked so noble that the princess could not help bowing before him. "'I am come to despise thee,' said he. "'Thou wouldst not have an honourable prince. Thou couldst not prize the rose and the nightingale.' "'but thou wast ready to kiss the swineherd "'for the sake of a trumpery plaything. "'Thou art rightly served.' "'He then went back to his own little kingdom "'and shut the door of his palace in her face. "'Now she might well sing, "'Ach, du lieber Augustin, alles ist weg, weg, weg.' "'End of the Swineherd "'Recorded by Gesine in Valletta.' March 2006